what's up to the point listeners it's your boy Cristiano, the host of to the point home services podcast and we got a doozy for you today i always love it whenever i get to do a podcast with a guest i don't know as well or i've not known for years and and what's always cool about this is this particular guest we're having on today was recommended to me from a previous guest that's been on dana hoddle um, from CNC up in Detroit, who I respect very much, who was just out here not too long ago for Rhino X. And we we're just having a conversation uh, around other female leaders that she respected and that I respected in, in, in a natural conversation. Our guest came up, so I'm excited to have her on the show today. I've heard about her company for years and the success of it and these great things, but never actually met. So today is the first time I am talking directly looking at her in her eyes via a, a computer screen <laughs> is Miss Mary Jean Anderson. And Mary Jean is the president and CEO of Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air Conditioning, which has been around since the year before I was born, 1978. Uh, I didn't mean to throw that out there, but like just thought I'd call that out. Um, big company, well-respected company, um, top 1% plumbing, heating and air conditioning businesses in the country. I know you serve, or you, maybe you did serve on the executive board of directors for Nextstar. I don't know if you're still doing that or if that's still a thing. And then also the, I not, yeah, I aged off the board. Uh-huh. Okay. Gotcha. So you, I'm not got it. And, but super proactive, um, you know, for women in the trades, part of women of next star troops for the trade, you know, troops, uh, troops to trades, um, all those good things, man, all the good stuff. And I heard you got a really great heart. So Aww. that's, that's great. Like I'll take that feedback all day long, but I'm excited to have you on the podcast, Mary Jean, and we're going to kind of jump into a little bit of your history, but, um, thanks for giving me your time. I think time's the most valuable asset we got. So I appreciate you giving me yours. Um, well, I appreciate that. I got honestly got to where I am because, um, I needed help and others, um, lended their time to help me. So if in this podcast today, I can give anybody anything that will help them. I will have feel good about that. Wonderful. Well, that's the plan here because you're going to have a few, f- few thousands of listeners that are listening to this, to your story that you're you might, uh, you might get your, uh, inbox filled up a little bit. And when we share at the end, so, um, okay. be, re- be ready for that. But I do want to jump into because, and part of this, I get to use for education as myself. And like I said, I love the story of the, and anybody that's been in the trades for a lot, you know, a, a decent amount of time, um, or at all. I just like to understand the story because there's been some incredibly successful, fast growing companies over the last even five years, six years, but there's also these tenured companies that I'm always intrigued by it because you've seen a few different things. You've went through a recession, you went through a pandemic, you've been through multiple things. And then, so I'm always just genuinely excited to hear like, how did you even get in the trades? I mean, how did, I mean, 1978, how did you get in the trades, Mary Jean? Tell me the story. And then if you would, along the way, just go ahead and take me up to um, current day, right? Because okay. you've you've had quite the journey and I just maybe hit some notable, like some notable points along the way. Sure. So last night I had a realistic, we had our 45th anniversary party here at the office and um, we all dressed in 70s clothes. And I thought when I, when everybody came in the clothing, I realized how long we've been doing this. So um Started out as uh, my husband and I started this together. I was in nursing and my husband was a new construction plumber who wanted to start a new construction plumbing business. He did that with a partner and and me. I was doing bookkeeping at night, which is another whole story since I'm (laughs) dyslexic. But um, uh, and um, we started the company, could never make any money. Um, Finally, in 1985, we bought his partner out. And I came into the business full time and we continued on this path of new construction. And and I want to say first, I know there's companies out there that make money in new construction. I get that. We never did. And I did not get the concept of them holding 10% when there wasn't 10% profit in the job and us paying our suppliers, our people. And then somewhere along the line, months and months later, we get paid plus that retention that they would help hold for six months. So we could never get ahead. Um, I wanted to do service and repair. Um, I, it made sense to me. Drains made sense to me. And um, But my husband was an outdoor kind of blow and go kind of guy. Didn't like service and repair. We um, dabbled in it. Um, we started, um, he trained our first technician by phone. Like literally he would go out, in the, not in phone, but by two-way radio. He would oh, gotcha. go out and say, hey, you know, and go back and forth and 
help him through um, repairing something. And um, he really didn't like it, but um, he saw that we weren't making any money. So um, in the meantime, um, we, we didn't do really well in it. I, I'm sure we didn't do a lot in it. And um, in 2000 or in, no, in 1995, I went to Arizona and opened a, a service and repair company. And I, it was straight service repair. We built that to 5 million in five years and then ended up selling it um, to get divorced. We split the uh, the profits of that company. We actually sold to Blue Dot. I don't know if you were around. You probably course. weren't around. No, I know, Blue, I, I know Blue Dot. I'm, I'm curious okay. to know what the company is that was here because I'm in Phoenix, yeah. Arizona. You're in okay. you're in um, San Diego, El Cajon area. Like that's where you're right? Yes, San Diego, right, right. I'm, I'm so, in Phoenix. Yeah, so we ended up getting divorced um, and then we worked together until 2004. And in 2004, he came into my office one day and we were doing more and more um, service and repair and more and more. And he just didn't like it. And honestly, you know, if I knew now what what I didn't know then, yeah. I would have um, he, there was a right seat on the bus for him and the company, but it wasn't in service and repair. It's a lot of people skills. That wasn't his strength. He had amazing strengths but not with people. And so I think that's where, um, so anyway, we, we ended up working together. One day he came in and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like it. I don't like where the industry's going. Well, great guy. Honestly, we're still friends today. He was last night. He was here for our um, party. And um, it was just that, that he believed that a paycheck was all you needed when you got your paycheck on Friday to thank you and to be appreciative for the work that you did all year all all that week long that's really not the way the difference the way we see things so um so he went into he retired actually i had a lot of debt in the company and i had a lot of debt to him but um i decided to take it on i thought i was actually getting my real estate license he didn't know it at the time and then i thought you know you've been bitching and moaning about it all this time (laughs) saying this is the way it should be done you might as well put your money where your mouth is and you might as well see if you can do this and um so we really started heavy into service and repair in 2005. And this is plumbing still, right? Just plumbing. Yeah. Well, yeah. That was just plumbing, residential, service and repair, no property management, no commercial work. This is, you know, just doing service and repair to your personal residence. Grinding it out. That was 05, you said? Pardon me? And that was 2005. 05, right. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so keep me going down the path. Did pretty well. Did very well, actually. Um, in plumbing. And so in 2007, I decided that it would be time for me to add heating and air since I knew what I was doing in a plumbing business. Right. Mm, sure. And, um, and I got this, you know, we were making money and paid off debt and paid off my husband and ex-husband and, you know, things were going well. So I bought a company that turned out to be all smoking mirrors. I did a due diligence, but apparently didn't do it thoroughly enough. Um, and um, then came the Great Recession. Did you do it yourself? Did you go through that diligence process yep. yourself? Oh, mm-hmm. poor! Yeah. I, I, I feel for you. <laughs> so, so sold. So, um, bought this company for five hundred thousand dollars, and um, added it into ours. Really didn't know what I was doing. Um, didn't know heating and air margins, and they're two different businesses. Oh, yeah. Even though business is business, and so um, then the Great Recession hit. And I was in trouble. And one thing that in my family, my grandfather was an immigrant from Italy. And um, I come from a family of hard workers. And I was raised that failure wasn't an option. So all of a sudden, 2009 comes around. And I'm a million dollars in debt. One million dollars. And now the Anderson Plumbing Company, I did set up two separate companies just just in case. Um, And... um, but it was paying off all the debt of the other company and money was getting really tight. Cash was getting really tight. I was getting sick physically, honestly, from the stress. The of stress, it. right. And yeah. And then, so I started looking around because there's one thing, let me back up one second. There's one thing in life I've been very grateful for. And that is having a learning disability, which I did not know I had until my daughter was diagnosed in ninth grade. And then it all made sense to me. So early on in life, I learned that, and it might be a woman thing as well, but I learned that if you want to, you have to ask for help. And this is if I could, to the listeners, I want to say this because I know, and I, I'm not trying to like put men in a different place, but men typically, 
I think because you're a man, you're supposed to be a man, you're not supposed to ask for help. And I think that's where our industry struggles and why we see companies that can't make it make it because they really don't want to ask for help. Right. And so that's what I did is, is I learned from a child that if I was going to get through school and I was going to get into college, which by the way, I dropped out of, um, so I don't even have a college degree, but, um, you have to ask for help. And so I, um, started looking around. Um, I, I talked to people in different businesses and then that's when I found Nexstar, and, um, I joined Nexstar. What year was that? And, and Nexstar, um, I did whatever they told me to do. And if they would have said, do cartwheels down the hallway, you know, I would have done caught with cartwheels down the hallway. <laughs> I remember my first meeting, which I said to um, my coach, I need to figure out how to double the size of my plumbing company to pay off all this debt and close heating and air. And she said to me, uh, we'd laugh about it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can we just talk about this? I'm pretty good at heating and air. So anyway, two years later, because I learned to ask for help and I listened to other people, I was able to work my way out of $2 million in debt, paid that off in two years and um, started making money and growing our company. Mary Jean, to what, what, what year was that? That was, I joined Nexstar in 2009. And you know, I remember that we were so deep into the Great Recession that John Conway, I don't know for people listening, probably know him, amazing guy, stood up in Washington. I flew up there and said, I was a million dollars in debt. He said, I didn't hit a million dollars in debt when I joined Nexstar. I didn't hit it. I was 959,000 or something like that. And he said, and I paid myself by doing what they told me to do. And I was in the audience, like crying, trying not to as anybody see the tears because I was a million dollars in debt. And that was the first hope that I had that if he could do it, I could do it. Yeah, that's good. And so it gets, I get emotional just talking about it. John's because, a great dude. I know John very well. Yeah, that changed my life. And that's where, you know, you said today you'd like the, this group listening to go, to come leave with something and I think one of the greatest things is don't have an ego, leave your ego at the door. We have all been through very similar problems, help each other be the best we can be. And that's what this industry is about. So it doesn't have to be next start. There's many groups out there, sure. but find a group, find a company that can help you and direct you a mentor and listen and leave your ego at the door, you know? So, so Today, our, our budget this year will come in. Um, we're on track on budget so far. Yeah. We're budgeting for just under 60 million. I think it's 59, 857 or something like that. Awesome. Um, we're in 230 homes a day, every day. Um, we're just, like I said, residential service and repair, double digit profitability. And um, we have we are very lucky to have brought women into the industry, into the field as well. And um, so... Yeah, it's been a great ride. Um, over the top thrilled. Love this industry. Um, love working with men. They're so honest. You know, there's we just decide where's the issue. We work through it. You know, it's a great industry. Yeah, I mean, well, can, one number one thing. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Pretty cool. Like, it's a pretty great story. It's a good journey and. You know, what I always love is, and you kind of were hitting on this be vulnerable piece or let go of your pride piece. And I do think that's uh, incredibly important to growth. Um, and I mean, I've, I've had to do uh, the same thing, you know, I mean, through, mm -hmm. through growing the business. And um, I have seen over the last few years, more and more people in the trades being open to um, asking that scary question of like, I need, I need some help. Um but to me, it wasn't difficult to figure out if I needed to get from A to B and I've seen, I know this person, this person, this person has been from A to B. Why would mm -hmm. I ask them a question? So I don't have to like struggle between A to B. Like they've already hit the roadblocks and they're willing to help me get there. And I could ask for help and maybe dodge a few, you know, hurdles um, that I was going to hit or financial burdens that you potentially could run into because that's obviously can be critical. So I have seen more and more of that. But but you you have 150 or so employees. I know you run a large operation, but here this is what you said. You have asked for help. And this is where I think our industry suffers 
um, a lot because I see people very segregated and they don't want to ask for help and they won't listen to anybody else. And, um, and it's, well, I would, I, it, it could be either, but I think it's just such, it's just, you know, the advice that we need to, to really understand that, um, you know, I'm very grateful to next star. I will do anything they ask me to do ever because I owe so much to them. And I'm so grateful. And there's been others along the way too. I mean, I can name specific people who just gave me what I needed from other companies too. Sure. And, um, you know, I'm very grateful and, um, oh, a lot to other people. And I hope that, that people listening to this will learn that and understand that it's okay to reach out. And there's many people that can help you out there and are more than willing to. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and I want to just, I'll give another shout out to John Conway. I was just on the phone with him last yeah. week and we do, we get to do a little bit of business together, which is great. I think he's a phenomenal human being. And I've heard so many stories about, about John. I mean, not just about his own, you know, his own business in Memphis, but just him as a human being, he's such a good dude, man. I, I like him so much. I mean, just a great yeah. guy. But right. and there's so many of those people, like I can't even name them all. There'd be so many, but yes, and, I and, agree. And you said a few things I want, I want to hit on too, is, um, when, I mean, your, your journey is kind of like, get ahead, hit, get ahead, hit like there's kind of some peaks and valleys in there too. And I do think that's fairly common in, in most business like model is it kind of looks like when people ever say, what's the path to success look like? And it's like this, 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 yeah. this, this, you know, up and down, up and down. Um, but you probably learned so much about what you're capable of doing in those moments because you have to push through. And I think one thing I can relate to you with is you, you're saying you're kind of, um, programmed to with work, with hardcore, like hard work ethic. You know, I, I grew up on a, on a farm. So like, I'm kind of come from the same, you know, cut from the same cloth and, and like failing isn't an option. You only fail if you quit type of mentality. And um, I'm glad I have that today. But I learned a lot and I thought, man, every time I go through something hard, um, if I don't learn something from it, it's a total waste beyond just the financial, you know, hardship that may have come from it or like whatever it is, or if it's losing an em employee that was a key player, like why did I, I, I learned something from each of these. So that way I was better each time. It, and so when it came up again, I was prepared for it and, and I could potentially get exactly. ahead of it. So exactly. That's the world I live in, but, I've, but I think it's just coming from this place of vulnerability of like being okay with asking, you know, because I would much rather feel that than feel like I'm losing my business and have to let people go. So I'm willing to put my pride aside yeah. for the greater good of the, of growing yeah. the business. Um, so, I, so something the that greater good of helping people, because think of how many people you're helping, just not just those families that you employ, but others that are listening to your podcast. So see, you are making a difference in the world, which is because it's not always about the money. And people here in our company will tell you all day long that I always say, you know, I get we need to make money and we have to make money to keep the business going. But it's not just about making money. If that's what your sole purpose is, you're going to fail. Our business is about helping people become the best they can be. And that's that's our business model. And um, so, you know, and that's the culture. And I think that's another thing you really have to have in business is you have to get that, you're, you know, it's not just about the money you're going to make for yourself and your family. It's about helping people succeed. Yeah. And you probably have some key leadership that would just get in the trenches with you, right? Like they would, they're going to follow you wherever you go. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. Because I would get in the, with the trenches with them and I would follow them wherever they go. And they know that about me. And that's great. I mean, and that is, that is culture, but that's, that's what you get from that is basically do what you say you're going to do, you know, and um, I'm a big believer in the reputation over revenue mentality. Um, and if, if you focus on those things and you focus on your, not just client fulfillment, but also employee satisfaction and those, you know, t to me, employee satisfaction means even more to me than client fulfillment because I need that leadership and that staff to support the client. So it's kind of a beautiful little circle, but you have and to have, a, yeah, it is because you know, like anyone here will quote you. I say it in meetings all the time is you can make a lot of money, you can make all the money in the world, but you can't take it with you. It's the difference you make. And I think that you, it, the one thing that we know here at our company, everybody, it's about helping each other. It's about helping our community. It's about doing community events. It's about helping different causes. And um, it just builds that culture of people that want to help each other. And so it's not that, you know, dog eat dog, like climbing up on the other person to get to the topics. We help each other get there. 
And I think that's been part of the success in building our company and having long-term employees who really care. That's, I mean, let's think about this. This is the number one. I don't care where you go in the country. You've been all over the country. I've been all over the country. In our industry, the number one thing you will hear, I don't care where you go, is um, that they can't find qualified people, service technicians. They're not out there. So how do you solve that problem? And that is culture, right? That is building the industry and retaining those employees and having other employees that want to come to your company to work for you. And then, of course, training. Yeah, so I, I have this in my in my questions to ask exactly what you just said. So I'm actually going to, to, to move to that because um, I have heard that for 15 straight years. And, and quite frankly, for me in the position I'm in as a digital marketing agency, um, I can have some impact on recruiting. I can do certain things, but there's so much more beyond me that, that really need to be done. Culture being a major thing. And, and so it can't just be about money it also has to be about like culture and like those types of things. But also I think this p- kind of plays into my, where I was going to go next with you is you've built a really great, uh, training program, you know, and you have the, um, Anderson career builder Institute and it can start there, right? Because it has to start like early on to start cultivating those things too. Now, I'm not saying you don't go, don't you have plenty of people who come in who don't need to go through that, but at least you're starting all everything. Like it has to, you know, when they come in, at least they've got, they've not been, well, I'm not sure because I don't know enough about, about your training program, but if they come in and they have no skill whatsoever, like they're literally learning everything from scratch, including right. culture. And that's what we do. We start from scratch. It's just been such a problem across the country. And what you start to see is people stealing each other's employees. And um, and those that usually jump ship aren't real. Hmm, I don't know. A lot of them are pass around employees that go from one place to one place, and they're really never happy. Those that stick with you are. And so it's really hard to find people out there. And I realized early on, there was a statistic I read a while, and it's been many years, because I started the school in 2017. So it was around that time, maybe 2016, the national PHCC had out. And that was that we are aging out. It's worse now from what I've heard, but we are, we were aging out in our industry at 10% per year and only 6% are in entering the industry. And so if you think about that, that it's supply and demand, and that's why we are paying our plumbers and HVAC technicians so much money, but by the way, they deserve it because of what they do. But um, that's why we're paying that that kind of money because supply and demand as well. And when you've got 10% aging out, 6% coming in, you've got to fill that. And it's, and I, I realize no matter, I mean, I realize it's expensive, but I think no matter how small your company is, you've got to, you've got to put it in your budget, put it in your pricing and price accordingly to be able to be training someone at all times because those people are very loyal to you. And so that's when we started our school. Um, we start with a 90 day pre-apprenticeship program and that's people that have absolutely um, no skills at all. I mean, they know nothing. And what we really look for are people that are um, hungry and humble and that are strong communicators. And then we teach them the traits and um, we've been very successful bringing men and women through uh, through our, our, I think we have about 14 or 16 women now um, that are in the field as technicians. And I think that's another thing that we have to continue to look at in our industry Absolutely. right now yep. is that, um, you know, there's all these kids going to college. We all know the story. They're all going to college. They are getting a degree. They've got all these big degrees, even doctorates and making $65,000 a year. And we pay double that, right? right. So, um, but how do you get the word out? to them, those people to come to the trades and not, not go to school. So it, you know, it, it's a, it, it, it's a, um, but it's necessary. And those that come in are so grateful and they're making such good money and, um, you know, men and women alike can do it now. It's not like it was in the old days where you were digging a ditch for my, you know, three feet or 10 feet to find a leak. It's you put your camera down there. Here it is. You go straight down and, you know, you got the right equipment and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> So it's a different industry now and women, we need to start thinking outside the box and outside the box, honestly, is bringing women into the trades. Love it. It, Uh, It's just a must to keep up with what's going on. Yeah. And honestly, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, it's almost like you being vulnerable enough to ask for help. 
uh, you can be a female and working in the trades isn't like it's you like it when you cash your checks like you know it's it's great and and i am seeing progression there like i i am gonna be because i feel like i've got a, a pretty good feel for the industry as a whole just based on h- how spread out i am um i have been seeing that more and more and and there's uh some that i think are taking a better more um professional path to that and I'm listen, I'm all for it. Like I've got three daughters. Um, and yeah. I'm game. I, I've worked with so many that, I, that, I, that of successful, you know, uh, women business owners in the trades and, uh, they live a pretty good life, you know? And mm-hmm. so I'm like, heck yeah, we can avoid any of that college. So like, the, I mean, for you to end up doing like whatever, I'm good with it. It's a respectful, it's a respectful, uh, job. And let me throw something out for listeners because, you know, you did, we talked prior to this meeting for all of you guys out there. And mm-hmm. he said, I would like you to leave some things for people listening. So I will say this, um, there is a program, there's military in a lot of towns. There is a program called skill bridge and skill bridge is what happens when milit- when people are getting out of the military um, six months before they get out, they can, they can come to a company and learn a skill and the military pays for them to come to your company you pay overtime, but they pay for your eight, them for their eight hours of, of work. So you can, now they will want some kind of curriculum. It doesn't have to be huge, but they will want them to learn some of the, you know, some of the codes or, you know, like the types of tools, how to use them, that kind of thing. You could probably do one day a week of them in the office where you're working with them and four days on the job. Most of it, of course, is on the job. But this is somewhere where you can, for the smaller companies that just can't figure out how they're going to do it, is you can go to SkillBridge. And um, if there's somebody coming out of the military in your area looking for your trade, they will be connected with you through SkillBridge and that will help you offset the cost of training people. But it's got it's a must. There's really, I can't see any other successful way of doing it other than you're getting those same guys that float around that yeah. are just and get out that are disastrous. You know, they can't stay anywhere. It is the so does SkillBridge do placement anywhere in the US? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Let's say um, you have you live in I don't know um, Dallas, and um, there's and he's going to be coming home to Dallas. If you have a program in Dallas, they'll connect you, and then you can um, and then you can use Skillbridge, and that's for your industry as well, Chris. I mean, it's any industry. Okay, Skillbridge is for all industries, but there are a lot of people in in the military. They're such a perfect fit for our industry. They, you know, they're they're in uniform. They learn to take direction well. They're disciplined. Disciplined, yeah. They are really a good fit for our industry, but it's all industries. Skill bridges for all industries. Okay, cool. That's great. I didn't know that. Now, in your in your training course, aside from that, kind of going taking a step back, you're not. Mm-hmm. Are you also teaching like soft skills and not just the technical skills too for some of these people? Yes. Okay. Yes, we um, are a next star. Uh, we are still next star. Mm-hmm. Um, and we use the Nexstar uh, programs for training our soft skills. We love Nexstar. Can't say enough about them. So we, we they're definitely soft skills. They go into um, take the service uh, tech training classes through them. And we do, my daughter actually teaches um, uh, the apprentice program. She'll teach Nexstar there as well. Got it. Um, okay. Well, so that's good because... Yeah, uh, in order to continue growing, you got to have people, right? And you want to try and minimize, you know, turnover. So having a great culture and and paying, you know, um, paying, wait, you know, good wages. Um, all these things matter. Like you, you, to, you want to minimize turnover. It's much easier to build a business. You got to keep backfilling people, um, or trying to find people. And you certainly don't want the roamers, the ones you're bouncing from place to place. But now. I- Go yeah, ahead. they build a loyalty too, especially when they're in class together. They become friends, and then they're riding with. Um, they're in class two days a week with us, and three days on the job training, and so they're building up the friendship. And and you know, you really retain them. They don't leave, and you know, as long they don't leave, and so it's a really good investment long term. Got it. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit into some more sure. like tactical stuff. Is that okay? Sure. Um, okay, so. You know, uh, you're in Southern California, um, you know, and, and I'm in a lot of like text message groups with a lot of other business owners and like variable, variable groups, but, um, 
the the first half of this year, uh, there's quite a few people who are like really struggled because it was super super slow. And um and 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 all of my groups are HVAC plumbing electricians. Like oh my, this is like my group. But but these are like buddies of mine, right? So I'm just in like accountability text message groups or whatever. But I hear everybody's you know frustrations and all those types of things. But one thing that probably helped you going through the 0809 phase is how to overcome slow seasons, you know, or recessions or whatever you want to call it. Um, challenging seasons, call it what you want, but they're recessions. Um, but when it's slow, um, you have to, you don't just retreat. Like you have to have things in place to work through slow seasons. And like the, the thing I like listening to is for those that are in Southern California are what are you doing to work through it? You're saying you're slow. What do you work? What are you doing to work through it? Are you outbounding? Like, what are you, I mean, are you guys experiencing the same thing? Like Q1 has been a little bit slower of a start. And if you have, have, or have not, like what have you guys been doing to power through it? Yeah. We actually had a really good January and February um, and March. The first two weeks have been good. We're starting to see a slowdown right now as I talk to you today, but we're really big on selling what we call our VIPs, our service agreements. Um, even if you call our company, when you go through the recorded message, it says, um, if you're a VIP, press one. And that's just, it all goes to the same call center. But in reality, we we want them to know that they are special. Sure. And um, so we sell our VIPs. And um, so during the slow season, we run those plumbing drain and uh, we sell a, a universal agreement for plumbing drains and heating and cooling. So we have that group of customers, about 10,000 that we can rely on to, and then we do specials. We do a low loss leader um, uh, uh, drain clearing special. Um, we call it 63 or free and we have, and that's for any drain. And then we have a, um, right now we're doing a $45 uh, tune up HVAC tune up. Um, so yeah, we do the loss leaders, but our guys are really trained on turnovers so that we get the, you know, we get them in the door and give them the opportunity and then look for those systems that really need to be replaced instead of repaired. If they need to be repaired, they need to be repaired, but we, you know, we do it honestly, but it's that it's the, it's the marketing. I mean, you really have to (coughs) have your, um, you know, you have to have your email addresses collected on all of your your employee, on all of your customers. So you can email, you need to direct mail, you need to touch your customers um, four times a year, right? And whether it be a VIP client or just a regular client so that you're top of mind awareness when they need somebody. And then specials always, you know, bring them around. What I do is um, I I have a, by department, I have a rolling five year and a previous year of revenue by department. So I'm always looking, my specials are always surrounded the lower, like, Number one is the best revenue for heating and air install. Number twelve, the worst of of the um, of the year. So my um, eleven and twelve happen to be uh, for is twelve is February, and eleven is March for our slowest months in heating and air. So we know that these are the months we're going to hit our specials really hard. We're always marketing those specials to everybody, and. Um, and of course, our VIPs. Got it. So, so, so okay. You've been really lucky. Well, I mean, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. <clears throat> um, so then maybe I wasn't actually, this is a perfect time to segue into that. Um, I'm a big believer in brand. Um, and I think that uh, the COVID years really exposed if you didn't have a great brand, like how important it really, really is to have that. Um, Cause that brand trust, that brand equity. Um but what's the mix that you, that you are kind of doing? I'm assuming, I mean, I don't know all the things because we've not, you know, we've not met. What is your marketing mix look like, like today that you guys are, that you rely on? And, and, and does it kind of been that way for a, a while now? Like using the mixture mm-hmm. of things? Yes. Yes. I think traditional radio is starting to really slow down. I'm not convinced that TV is just yet. Um, And so, of course, we do radio and television and, um, you know, drive times are a really good one, too. Um, The drive times on the radio, people are listening to drive time when they're trying to get home. I think that's the one time in sports are the one time that people are listening to the traditional radio stations. So we do a little bit of radio. Um, We we still are pretty heavy in TV. And believe it or not, we're still very heavy in the yellow pages. And I know listeners are going to go out there and go, you got to be kidding me. (laughs) 
but I track every call, every penny spent on everything I do. And Yellow Pages were, you know, the place to go. In fact, when I was in Phoenix, I had the company there. You know how I got ahead and I grew it to 5 million so fast? A triple truck came out in Yellow Pages. Wait, wait, wait. What year was that? Mary Jean, what year was that? Oh my God. That was in 1999, I think. So my, my very first, first job. My very first job that got into advertising was the yellow pages for what was Quest Dex here, which was like the biggest yeah, book. Was Quest that was my very first company that I worked for. Where like I got into advertising was the phone book. <laughs> and I had the triple track back in the day. That the was three page, but that was how, it, yeah. And, and so I was able to grow the company really quickly. And then when Blue Dot took over, they pulled that out and it just crashed. But yep. Um, but, but I'm saying that they were so expensive. Now the price is so very, very inexpensive, but the return on the investment for what you're spending is still in yellow pages, believe it or not. So we touch our own customers four times a year. We do, we send emails. Um, we're now texting reminders. We, um, send out postcards four times a year, um, to them, um, you know, and, and, and all of that. We do pay per click, um, um, but again, brand building, you want to be top aware, um, aware, yep. you want to be the top of awareness when someone is looking for someone. So that's where the brand comes in. We do a lot of community events. I told you we were all about the community. So we go into a, uh, a neighborhood where we do it in several different ways, but we go into one neighborhood or one community. It might be it might be the police community. It might be the gay community. It might be whatever community we go into. And we we do a full circle of, of just about everything. And we go community at a time or neighborhood at a time where we get, you know, billboards on the entrance of those neighborhoods. Yeah. We get bus stops on the entrance. And then we do events in those communities, whether it be concerts in the park or, you know, we do a lot all the way around it. But, you know, I did want to say something else, too, is about the mix uh, about uh, marketing. And that is where we really grew a lot was actually during the um, the great recession, because I never backed off on my marketing. And I think when times get like this, where they're slower, the first thing everybody does is pull back on their marketing. Right now is the time for you to get market share. So I know it's expensive. I get it, but this is where you really want to invest in the branding and the growth of your company through, through marketing. Yeah. So thanks for saying that. Um, have, you know, when I started the company in 2008, my wife and I started the company in 2008, Mm -hmm. um, right smack in the middle of that first gnarly little recession. Right. But what was great about that was it made some of those who relied so much on what they were, what they've always done to start to think differently. And they started to, to flirt with building a website and doing some internet marketing. And I was early to the game then. So we had a nice little bump well, guess what? During COVID, because at this point in time, um, I had been in this space now for quite a while. And when COVID hit, I had about like two weeks of like probably everybody trying to figure out like what is actually going on. And then I started realizing that um, fear of was going to hit people and people were going to pull back kind of like in a recession. And I said, well, I reached out to all the account managers and I said, we need to make sure as many of our customers double down as possible because right now people are going to pull back and we can really take a chunk of market share because COVID or not, people are going to have to get in these homes. And that's when I figured out if I could just put on these websites, I got first of the game at this thing. And I shared with all my competitors, like all my other competitive agencies, because I'm a rising tide raises all ships guy. Um, Mm -hmm. But I created those little badges that said no contact service call. And we started slapping those on the website. So that way with the little mask, and then next thing you know, you see them all over everybody. So I think we shared like somewhere like 12, 13,000 of those things for two people. Like I, I, I did one post said, if you want it, here it is. You can download it. And then everybody took it and started creating their own, which is a cool thing to give back to the industry during that weird time. But it helped because it helped people say, I know I need to get somebody here because regardless, uh, I need my drain unclogged or I need whatever done. But mm-hmm. one brand recognition really showed itself then. But if, if, even if you didn't have that, as long as you put on there, like I can get there tomorrow and we take precaution, like it was a conversion tool to get them to actually call you, but you could dump, we doubled down during that time. And really our company and our, and our customers hit a whole nother like rocket. And we've been on that wave ever, ever since. So Mm -hmm. I, I asked you that question going into this year, because I do believe that, um, the last few years have been like an anomaly in the business, right? Cause every, like yep. every, so many companies did so great 
And there's right. so much more new equipment in homes than ever before that, yeah. that demand, demand calls are going down, like we are, are going down. So you, but you don't say, well, it doesn't work. Like now you got to continue yeah. to go all in. Cause now there's like, Oh, sorry, yeah. I got to pull back. Cause my cost per lead is, you know, is high in the first quarter. It's the same mentality that people will fall into. And yeah. I'm a big believer in doubling down when, when it starts exactly. to get tough. You have to double down. And it's, it's right now there is a correction going on. We know that. And, um, so now is the time for you to gain that brand awareness because we're talking about pay-per-click. And I will say that we use a lot of pay-per-click and, but when it gets slow, then the, the cost per lead goes way up. So the brand, them knowing your brand, that brand awareness in, in pay-per-click, you know, is, is so important in the search engine optimization to be there and then recognize your brand. It's so important. Yeah. And you should be able to, at some point in time, use your paid ads as a lever when you need it, like any right. drink, cleaning business I need. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, and again, when, when you've been at it this long for me and we only have done this, you figure out what levers to pull at, at what times of year and which regions at what temperature for HVAC, like all those things. But right. branding is always the best. It's cheapest lead. <clears throat> um, so I do want to segue into one more thing too. We're like already 45 minutes into this thing. Oh, wow. Okay. I know. I know. That's what I'm saying. So um, one other thing I want to talk about is, um, is the like the inflation that comes with all the things that have happened is the cost to do business is, is going up and it continues to go up. And, and it's not like a manufacturer, it's all manufacturers and are increasing costs. And so people struggle to figure out how to, um, how to change, like to pay attention to the financials, to change the financials, to make sure you're still making money because we are for profit. Like you'd have to pay the bills. Um, and they get, are you getting nervous to raise your, your prices? Um, but you have to, like, you have to, you have to. You have to. And no. so how are you guys like, how did you, how, I mean, you're kind of seasoned to have like understand the game of this inflation piece of it, but how did you guys handle that? And and then if I can piggyback that on, on um, is or what are some of the things that you're doing? Did you go and negotiate with your suppliers or manufacturer or like credit cards you're using or like what is maybe tell me kind of what your guys's plan has been to to win in this whole inflation game yeah um well it's it's being on top of your price changes as soon as they come to you and you do the best you can to negotiate but everything is so much more expensive i don't care if it's you know your contract renews for um What's our software program? I'm blanking at the minute. Service, um, Titan. service Titan, or whether it's you know um, your your financing with Green Sky or whatever. I mean, it's it's not just equipment; it's everywhere, and you have to raise your prices. And you know, if you're not really comfortable with that, um, I, I have a friend that's better at, than I am at it, and she raises. And I've started doing this, and I got this from her: um, raise your prices every single quarter. And you just raise them a little bit. So in a year, you've had a 10% price increase, but your technicians are only seeing two and a half percent a quarter. Now, depending on where you are, if you didn't do this last year, as, as the prices were increasing, that's going to be hard for you to do today because, but you're going to have to do the 10% price increase or 15%, whatever it is. It, this is not uncommon for us. And this is where I think a lot of us are going to get stronger because I think people that don't really have a grasp on the cost of to do their business aren't going to. And you should have looked at in this year, at least a 10, if not 15% price increase for, for 2023. And the thought is for people listening, Oh my God, there's no way I can't even get work as it is. No, you'll get the work. It doesn't have anything to do with that 15% price increase. It has to do with the service that you're providing. And if you're providing quality service, you're wowing those clients um, you know, um, they, they don't notice that 15% price increase who really notices it is your, is your technicians. And yeah. that's why if you can do them incremental regularly, they know what to expect. Yeah. It's a progressive approach. I like that. Cause really it's a psychology play. That's what that is. Because it is a psychology play. You're right. Got it. And if you listen to them, you know, it, but you, you just have to work with them, you know? And, and I think a lot of times what happens is, what they're thinking is, oh man, I don't want to have to go and give this price increase to the homeowner. Well, the homeowner, you know more than the homeowner knows, like on what that price is, and and of course, you have to create enough value to make it worth it as well. Like so, there's right. these things, but typically, 
it's, they overthink it. You're overthinking. Like you're almost spending the homeowner's money for them. Like you're trying right. to be conservative for them when really it's the cost to do business. Like us at Rhino have only a handful of times ever done cost increases when we had to, because as the business gets bigger, um, it requires a lot more training, um, employees, you know, equipment, all these things to do business. And then ultimately Google isn't getting cheaper. It's getting more expensive. Oh, everything is. I mean, honestly, if people are listening and have not done a, at least a 10%, and I think more like 15% in price cr- increase for 2023, you're way behind the ball and you're going to end up financially. You know, there's nothing more stressful than dealing with client concerns and dealing with employee issues and then not really having, making any money to show for it. You know, it, it just, that stress is, and I've been there. I did this, you know, been there, done that. And you just, it, it's just, you got to go up that. I know what the prices are going and we're a larger company. We get better discounts on buying our equipment. And I know for us, you know, 10% was bare minimum. We did 15. <clears throat> well, and, and you still have, well, if you think about this, when you're trying to recruit really solid talent too. You got to pay for the talent. So you have to have the money to do it. Yeah. So, exactly. you, you know, so you, mm-hmm. you got to do it. But, but what I'm hearing you say is you, you know, don't overthink this price increase. It has to be done to sustain business, to, to continue to move the business and grow the business forward and retain the people and all the things you have to do it. It's not like a, and it didn't impact you negatively. Did it Mary Jean? No, not at all. Actually, not, not at all. So, one bit. so you're still nope. able to grow this thing and, and by increasing your prices to 15% and like, it's not, there's not, you know, the homeowner's not like you increased your prices 15%. They have no idea. Exactly. And we didn't lose any employees and we didn't lose any customers. And, um, it is what it is. We are already the high, a higher price company in town because of all we offer to our employees and to our clients and the warranties we have. So we are higher priced anyway. But no, and, but I, I really think, and, and this is what I did just start doing this is every quarter raising my prices. That helps a lot, but it wasn't something, you know, again, how we, we start this, it's, you know, working with people in the industry and learning best practices and sharing your best practices. And this happens to be a best practice of another woman that I adore um, uh, on, on the, on the West coast. And she's like, Every, every quarter, no matter what, they just know, no one, no one, you know, the price books are up every quarter done that forever. And and so there's never a question. There's no stress over that at all. So that's something I took on, but again, I learned it from someone else. It's called Robin duplicate. Yeah. <laughs> and then you make it your own. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, we are like right at the tail end of this thing too. And, and this is what's great about these, any of the podcasts I do is, um, when they go, when it seems like it goes really fast, it means there's like really good conversation going on. And, and I actually am, um, I think my biggest takeaway just from this too, is I didn't even know skill bridge was a thing for me. Um, yeah. you know, and we have full-time recruiting in house here too, you know, but, it, but it gets challenging to find like leadership, like core leadership. And, it, and, and, you know, if you can imagine Mary Jean in my world, when we have a, a service, that's like social media. Um, everybody thinks they're great at social media just because they know to make, posts and you know, like that's not really what, it, what it is. Um, but we're in a, um, in a different space than you, like the, it, the digital marketing world, we have a lot more opportunity than, than the trades, than the trades do. Um, meaning we have a lot more options. Like we're getting lots of applications, not that they're all like legit going to be an option, Yeah, but yeah. we have more, a bigger, you know, so we have a bigger pool to pick from. But um, I didn't realize that was that was an option. And I'm a you know I'm a um, a big fan of military. I mean, my my dad's a veteran. My grandparents are veterans. Like so, we're big and uh, and I didn't even know that was an option. So to me, um, that's something worth for, worth me looking into as well. I didn't even know it exists. But I but I think what I love most about um, this is I love any time I hear a great story about perseverance and kind of and like uh, comeback stories. And you've had like a few, you had to go through a few of those. When you start talking about new construction, my brain immediately went to like, how the hell do you do that when you're just doing new construction in the beginning? Cause the margin's so thin and when you get paid and you got to have the cash flow and you got to have all these things. And so the world I live in is out on replacement and service. I'm in the residential out on replacement and service space. Right. I do nothing with new construction right. whatsoever. Right. And it's a relational game and it's a long-term game. And, and that's not f- for me, but 
the other stuff I'm in. Yeah. We don't even do property management, to be honest with you. I don't even like property management because we want to do the work today, get paid today, pay your guys on Friday and try to try to work with your, your vendors to pay them in 60 days instead of 30. And that way your money can work for you. And so that's what we do. Um, you know, with as many vendors that allow us to push to 60, we use that negotiating as well. Um, cause it's an important one. Got it. I'm going to, um, yeah, price or Costco used to be price club. That's that <sighs> was their whole business model. That's where I really started getting the idea years ago, why I wanted to get out into construction and into service for those exact reasons. And that's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Last question. This is going to be, I'm always interested to hear what someone answers on this one. Um, because you've been at it quite a while, you've had plenty of time to have thought through this. And my guess is you've probably been asked something along these lines before, but this is my last question to you um, for, for our listeners. And and I think that it's important to understand a lot of the listeners on this are, you know, there's technicians, there's owners or GMs. I mean, there's a lot of private equity that listens to this too for different, for other reasons. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, you have quite a few people in, in, uh, your family, um, with your turn point relationship too, that I have really mm -hmm. great relationships with, you know, friends of mine. Um, and I love asking these, you know, different successful companies, this question. And that is, as you were scaling and growing this thing and based on what you know, now what's one hire you would have made sooner now that you know what you know. So like, what's the one pivotal position that you put off? Like a lot of people will say, oh, I didn't hire a CFO fast enough when it's time for a CFO. Or they might say, I don't have a, it didn't get a really great, you know, really great controller fast enough. Or um, I didn't pay enough attention to a good dispatcher. And so I'm like, I'm curious to know based on like where you're at today, what is one hire that you would have made sooner if you knew then what you know now? So I didn't get my questions in advance, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going a completely different way because yes, you have to know your numbers. We've all heard this. We need to know our financials. The one I would have done earlier, believe it or not, I bet no one said this inside sales. So we have, um, when something doesn't sell, we have a team of inside salespeople. They're called production managers. And what our production managers do is when something doesn't sell, they call back and they keep that customer going so that we close at a discounted rate most often. Sometimes it's a very tiny discount rate. It's amazing. Sometimes it's throwing something else in. But there we call it sniffing around the trash can looking for scraps. <laughs> and um, it's, the, it's the customer you paid for that you didn't get first out. It could have been that the technician didn't connect. It could have been so many different things that um, that why they didn't buy from you that day, but you still paid the money for that customer to call you. And um, we're hiring our fifth one right now. We've been doing it for a while. You know, you can only add so many as size of your company, but I would say that that, because you've already paid for the customer, that the inside sales rep is probably the one thing that I had done years earlier, I'd probably even have a bigger customer base than I do now. I've never got that answer before. So you're the first. Um, and it makes sense. Do you, are you training them through your program or are you bring in training for them? Oh, we train through our program. Yeah. Yeah. Actually next star now has a program, um, that, that, uh, and we just had them out. We invented this years ago. Um, actually it was John Conway who started it and we were friends. And so kind of talk back and forth, put our people together and kind of came up with a program. Um, and uh, I really more copied him than he copied me, that's for sure. But um, yeah, and that's, you know, after joining Nexstar, that was one thing we started early back with just one person. And um, it's just, you paid for that person to call. Why didn't they close with you? Yeah. If somebody called you and their guard disposal isn't working, why did you walk away from that call? Well, now you have your inside salespeople who are good. You know, they're really strong communicators there. I don't know what people use. We use color code. We use disc. Oh, yeah. We use different things, but they're that outgoing person that, you know, the friendly person that calls and, you know, production manager, what went wrong. And, you know, it kind of goes like, you know, we have an opening tomorrow and I know we're out and um, I'm the production manager. I got to keep Mary Jean wants all of our guys to be busy. Never wants them to sit down. If you want to do it tomorrow, I can take 20% off or whatever. And we get, or get someone else out there to re rebid it a different way, whatever it takes. Once you pay for that customer, don't let them leave you. So, um, sorry, another quick question to that is, are you doing that year round? It's not just like in shoulder oh, yeah. seasons. Okay. So that's a year round deal. 
Yep. And we're just hiring for our fifth one right now. And um, yeah, it's full on. And then we have uh, two outbound people too. I would say that's another thing is to have people constantly outbounding to your existing co- offering your VIPs and offering the specials that you have running for the month. Got it. Cool. Well, yeah, that's great. I did. That's the first one. So that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Hey, quick question. Did you, did you, you've done the color code? We use, we, we just moved to something called culture index, which is color code and disc on steroids combined. Yep. Um, it's a little bit expensive, but I love color code. And we, if you are in my office, any office you go into has color code, um, you know, everywhere I'm a red blue, um, and, and I love color code, but discus takes it. It's just a, a little bit more, you know, how things are getting improving year after yep. year. Yep. I'm a, um, so I'm actually a yellow purist, but my second really? color, my second color is red. So I'm a, I'm a yellow red, but I'm very okay. heavy, very heavy yellow. So, um, yeah, we, but the red is what, yep. what is pushing you, drives you. That's the driver. Yeah. And, and your yellow is why people like you. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're the fun guy. I'm the fun guy, but my, but my, my wife is our COO and she's brilliant and she is the backbone of the business. She's all things finance operation. Like, so she kind of oversees those things, which so our, our skill sets complement one another. Um, mm-hmm. but she is a, um, red, blue. Yep. Same as me. Yeah. <laughs> We're drivers, but it's that personality and the driver, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So. And yeah. well, listen, exactly. like this has been fantastic and I, pr- I appreciate you giving me the, you know, the time and, and, and it's been good getting to know you. And like I said, like the, the more I talk to you, the easier it's got, I can kind of get to the vibe for, for who, for who you are. It's cool to end with the color code test because we, we, we did start to do that internally, like with a lot of our staff, mm-hmm. just to learn how to communicate with one another or to understand when you're going into a situation with someone on how they receive information or how you should give it. Um, yeah, we still, I don't have my tag on, but I would flip it and show you, we all wear them on our tags. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, and we have them. We have them in the offices. So you're, if you manage a group of people, yeah. like if they're whatever their primary color, you'll see their face. So when someone comes into the office, um, you look at it. And go, okay, he's a white. I gotta have my patient's cap on. You know, I gotta. He's not gonna make a decision today. You know, it teaches you how to really deal it with does. different personalities. It's a great program. It, it's fantastic. And and I, but in, in initially, because I've done the disc profile and I'm a high ID and disc, um, but that's the one I connected the most with the color code because it's it was mm-hmm. so helpful with just communication. And it also was helpful for me not prejudging someone but once I understood yeah. what their color code was. So I could be like, okay, they just don't show emotion. Like here I am excited, and they're like, that doesn't mean they're not yeah. excited, it just means they receive the information Absolutely. differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, For me, it's putting my patient's hat on when a white comes in because I know I'm not going to get an answer today. And I'm oh, like, you yeah, and me right both. Now, you know? yeah, so. It's the hardest for me too. <laughs> well, great well, time. Mary Jean, thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have you on here too. And, uh, and just to share the story and to share some of the things that you'd had. And, and again, congrats with, with the success. And, um, and certainly, you. you know, your reputation precedes you. Like I've heard good things all these years, you know, we've never met. That's always a good thing, you know? And, um, so to me, you know, reputation really matters, you know, to me and, and, and along with, you know, good reputation comes respect. And, uh, and, and I like that kind of leadership, uh, regardless if you're male, female, don't matter to me. Like, right. um, uh, people want, you know, like you've heard a lot of people will say that they, you know, or you've heard people say people leave, uh, leaders, not companies. And so, uh, I think, you know, having a good, being a good reputable person with integrity who wants to continue to grow, but genuinely has like the heart to want to help you be better at your job, but also your personal life. Like that's great culture. And I'll follow that any, anytime. And right. you can't just get lucky at that when you've been in business this many years that you've been in business, like you've got some things figured out. It's legit. And, and I'm glad I finally got to meet you. So thanks for sharing your story and sharing some of the stuff with our yeah. listeners. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I hope I helped somebody out there. A hundred percent you did. And, and, and if you don't mind, Mary Jean, would you, would you be open to maybe even just sharing a contact information? If someone wants to reach out, maybe ask any more questions and like specifically, are you open to that? Sure. Sure. Um, emails best MJ for Mary Jean, my initials MJ at Anderson. And that's A N D E R S O N P H A.com plumbing, heating, air, right. MJ at Anderson, PHA.com. Perfect. Well, take advantage. Right. Like you said, we talked about, right. you know, being, you know, being, uh, 
okay and putting your pride down and asking for help like she opened the door wide for you listeners to be able to reach out to her so mary jean again i appreciate it i'm gonna go ahead and finish this podcast with the review which is what i typically do um and this one is discover the power of humility from sales ceo so don't know who that is but appreciate you leaving us a five-star review says i recently listened to the two-point podcast hosted by cristiano and featuring keith mercurio as a guest um Love Keith. He's a great dude. I have to say this episode was super dope. (laughs) Keith brought a level of humility to the show that is truly inspiring. That's what Keith does and made a very engaging and informative conversation. Chris did an excellent job in guiding the conversation and and eliciting valuable insights from Keith. The show has had a direct impact on my life and business, providing helpful strategies that have positively impacted my growth. I highly recommend to the point podcast, especially if you're looking for valuable marketing insights in the home services industry. Absolutely. Thank you. I didn't read that ahead of time. So I like to read them like on the air. So sometimes it works out good. Sometimes it doesn't work out good when they're not complete. <laughs> so I'm going to find it because I love Keith. I need his inspiration. So I'm going to go find it. I'll text it to you. I'll make it easier. I'll, I made it, make it easier on you. Keith is a, is right. a great human being. I like him a lot, but Mary Jean, I appreciate you so much. Thanks for giving back to our listeners and to our listeners off okay. close with this. You don't have right. to do everything, but you got to do something. No zero days. Listeners, thank you so much again for listening to this podcast week after week. We are extremely grateful. Again, the whole purpose of this podcast is to give back to the home services industry that we love so much, whether you're a rhino or not. We really, really appreciate all the subscribers. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please go in and subscribe and you'll get all the episodes sent to you automatically weekly. Also, we have really enjoyed your feedback. Uh, It's so meaningful for us when we get to read the nice comments that you guys put. So keep doing that. And if you don't know how to do it, Here's what you got to do. You search for To The Point Home Services on Apple Podcasts. You click on our profile, scroll all the way down to the bottom and hit write a review and be honest and share your story and how the podcast has impacted you and your business. Thanks again from the bottom of our hearts at To The Point Home Services Podcast. We appreciate you.